بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين على مر على مر الدنيا والدين وصلى الله على سيدنا مرسلين الخاتم النبيين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like the host. I need a little more energy. You gotta remember, I'm from America. I just had a nine-hour flight. I have not been to sleep yet. So, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair. I need a little energy. Alhamdulillah. I know you guys have been waiting a while, and I really appreciate you waiting for uh, just to listen to me. Uh, many of you don't even know who I am. Uh, just real briefly, mashallah, Allah blessed me to come to Islam in 1992. Um, I was a Christian prior to that, pretty strong Christian too. Uh, you know, went to church as much as I could, worshiped as much as I could, uh, tried to be involved with my church as much as, as much as I could. But alhamdulillah, Allah brought me to the light and the of Islam to understand who He is and who my beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And since then, I've had the opportunity to go abroad and study. I studied in Syria for three years, and then I went to uh, Tarim, Yemen, and studied there for another five years, and came back to the United States in 2003, after which I uh, kind of began this uh, quest for you know, giving reminders. And uh, we started uh, an Islamic school, and it uh, didn't last long, obviously. Um, but that's how it goes in America. We're not as advanced as you are here. You know, uh, people are broke in America, contrary to popular belief. Uh, but anyways, so uh, much after that, uh, just started, you know, I guess as my father would say, I got a real job and started just <coughs> teaching on the side and uh, giving lectures when I can. So that's just a short version of Jamal Haisal. I'll tell you, the title we have here today Another Day in Paradise. Are any of you familiar with that song? Yeah. Who wrote it? Brandy. Who? Oh, no, Phil Collins. Phil Collins. Did you say Brandy? <laughs> <laughs> That's old. <laughs> Not as old as Phil Collins, but it's a fun one. Tell you, this song, Another Day, Another Day in Paradise, it's basically a cynical song about a woman who's homeless, who has nothing. But hey, another day in paradise. Another day in the life of someone who's striving and having problems and is struggling through life and can't seem to make it. Hey, another day in paradise. We're living in civilization. We're living in one of the wealthiest countries. I mean, you guys are living in England, you know, they, they used to say that the Sun set on the British Empire and used to rise on the empire. One of the greatest, supposed to be one of the greatest countries. Of course, next to mine. Right? But nonetheless, homeless people are out there, people struggling, dealing with drugs, dealing with alcoholism, dealing with being molested, dealing with getting raped. People are dealing with poverty. People are the kids out there who are wishing they had something to eat, wishing they had a parent to complain about them going to bed on time someone to nag them and, and get them to be motivated to be something in their lives. They wish they had that, but again, that's another day in paradise. You all are college students, so none of that applies to you. You have another uh, set of situations. You have another set of problems. But you don't have the problems of the people that are out there. Many of you don't know what it's like. Some of you do. Some of you, part of it wasn't easy to get to this university. Some of you probably had to scrap. You had to do whatever you could do to get here. Your parents are probably, I mean, I don't know if you guys have to pay for your university. I know in my country we do. And people are taking out mortgages on their homes, taking out loans, just so the children can go to school. We have a saying that math is what got them in, but finance and economics is what kept them out. And that's the problem. Another day in paradise. Many of you are struggling just trying to make a prayer every day. 
many of you are trying to struggle with, you know, should I wear my hijab today or should I not? Should I put on a little eyeshadow? Should I not? A little lip gloss? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Some of us are saying, should I trim the beard or should I let it grow? Until you hear a sister Fatima say, you know, you look better with trim. <laughs> <laughs> then you're all trimmed up the next day. Some of us are dealing with the fact that trying to find a good wife, whether I should go back to Pakistan or back to my mother country and get my wife, or should I find myself one right here, but you know, these women want too much, so let me go back home. <laughs> and sisters dealing with issues, well, you know, should I should fight my parents on making me marry some guy back at home who probably came to speak English and doesn't have the education that I have or I'm receiving, or do I try to find one of these tired, shipless brothers here who think they just know it all? <laughs> Right? So there are a lot of different problems in the day of paradise. Right? But one of the things I really want to talk about and stress in this so-called paradise, because we all understand, at least we should understand at this point, this is not paradise. The Prophet ﷺ said that this dunya is what a sijil al mu'min. It's the it's a prison for the believer, but lacking who a jinnah the kafir. It is a jinnah, it is a place of wonder, a wonderment and a, a paradise for those people who don't believe. And I want you to take time to just think about that. Because, I mean, one of the things many of you will do, and many of you don't do, is reflect. And one of the things that we have to reflect upon are the things that we've been, we've been hearing over the years. I'm not, I, that's how deep I just said to you, quote it. It's not something you haven't heard before, except for maybe this guy. Are you Muslim? Yeah. Oh, well, then you probably have heard it. So the thing is that for many of us, we haven't heard everything. No, I didn't mean to pull it, point you out. That's I, mean, right. I just had to ask the guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it'd be kind of unusual for me to see a Pakistani person who wasn't Muslim. <laughs> you know, but, you know, Allah knows best. But, alhamdulillah. But nonetheless, you understand my point. Okay? You understand my point. But it's time that we start reflecting. As students, you are looked at as people who are thinkers. You are looked at as people who are contemplators. You are looked at people who are planners. You are looked at as people who are future leaders. So therefore, I'm asking you to do what is expected of you, and that is to reflect. To reflect on this life and reflect on the hereafter. To spend time and look at where you are in terms of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's what really makes the difference. You know, I'll be honest with you, I mean myself, I'm kind of tired of the traditional parochial methodology in which we approach things in terms of how we feel we should look when we come to the masjid. Or how we should look and act when we are out and about amongst one another. Whether I wear a phobe or not does not mean that I have a lot of taqwa. Whether I have a long beard doesn't mean that my iman is in the right place. It means that I'm adhering to the sunnah, yes, but it does not mean that I'm, I have more taqwa than you. It doesn't mean that I'm closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than you. Yes, we adhere to the sharia. I'm not saying don't. But what I am saying is, is that we have to focus on the, the, the root or the foundational point of everything that we do in this life. And that, is, and that foundation is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because why? What happens if it doesn't work out that way? As the poet used to say about the dunya, he said, a dunya, here, aqillu bina qalili, wa ashikuha adhillu bina dalili. He said that the love of this dunya, the love of this life, right, is one of the most abased things. But first he says that the dunya is the most useless thing of all things. It's the smallest of the small. And to love it is one of the most abased things. Because why would you love and chase after and run after something that's immaterial? That means nothing at the end of the day. Why do I say it means nothing? Because think about it. When you die, what are you going to get out of this dunya? And I'm asking you, what are you going to get out of the dunya? Huh? Anything? Your deeds. Well, your deeds, is that part of dunya at that point? 
There's nothing else in this dunya that, is going to, that, that you're going to benefit from, unless, of course, you have children that happen to be righteous and read Quran, or as you put it, the deeds that go on that help benefit you. If you've left something behind that other people are going to benefit from, but if you don't have any of those things, the dunya doesn't do anything for you, except surround you. You have a new home in the ground. So why would you love something that that's, that's what it has to offer you at the end? You see, it's like, a, like when you go out to get a job. Hopefully, when you go out to look for positions and employment, you're going to look for positions that are going to allow you growth and seniority. So you're not stuck doing the same thing 17 years from now. How many jobs have I worked at and I've asked someone, I mean, this job just stunk. I mean, it sucked. And I was like, wait a minute, how long have you been doing this? Oh, 17 years. How long have you been doing this? Oh, 15 years. And you're thinking to yourself, how? But they have no more motivation. They don't have the desire to go beyond. As Muslims, we have the desire to go to, the, to our fullest. So hopefully when you're looking for a job, you're looking for a job that is going to allow you to grow. You can move up the ladder, as they say. That's how we have to look at things. What well, we should not look at the dunya as being anything less. Is the dunya going to allow us to grow? The answer is no. Not in the end. It's not going to allow us to grow. It's going to take us away from everything. So again, why would you love something that's going to take you away from your ability to grow? So then the poet goes on to say, Well, mm, let me rephrase that. He says, uh, so that it what it poisons people with its magic. It blinds you. The dunya blinds you from seeing what? The reality of things. The Prophet used to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him to see what the reality, the truth in everything. We're able to see that same truth, but it comes with reflection. We're able to see through all the, the, the foulness and the cheapness and the delusions with reflection on the real. And when I say the real, I'm talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which means that we have to come to an understanding as to who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. One thing that the brothers on the Minhaj, the brothers and sisters on the Minhaj have right, is that we should all be studying our aqidah. Because we are, more important, not just aqidah, but tawheed. Because tawheed helps us to understand who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. How do we worship someone we don't know anything about? Imam al-Ghazali says that worship is not even valid if you don't even know who it is you're worshiping. So we should be trying to take our time to learn about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so that we can become closer to him, so that we can hopefully uh, uh, be able to see the reality in everything. As the brother just read when he said, Hu ala kulli shayin qadir. What does that mean to you when we say that all things, Allah is able to do all things? What does that mean to you? That Allah is in control of everything. What does that mean to you? I mean, is it just something we just hear and say, oh, mashallah? <laughs> or is it something we sit down and think, man, what does that mean? Allah's in control of everything, man. Jeez. So, you know, if I take that test, regardless of how much I study, the results are still with Allah. If I don't study, the results are still with Allah. If I pay my bill, if I don't pay my bill, this will happen, that will happen. Just take your time to think about who Allah SWT really is. And then taking time to understand who Allah is in relationship to you. 
Because as it says at the end part of that poem, he says, but these are the people who are what? Misguided and have no leadership. Because why? Once you've been blinded, blinded by the dunya, you don't know who to follow, where to follow, and you're only subject, you're subjected, or you're left to be subjected to your very own desires. And once your desires take over, it's a wrap. I'm sorry, it's a wrap. That's how we say it at home. It's a wrap, pal. Because why? The dunya has taken over and is, is joined forces with your nefs, with your own halat, your own desires. And guess what? It's just going to lead you away from becoming closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how can you expect to have leadership when we know that we ask Allah to guide us what on the straight path? So how can you be guided on a straight path if you don't even know what the path is? And you don't know what the path is because why? You've allowed yourself to go astray and be blinded by the love of everything in this life and everything that you desire to do on your own. It's as if you know how to do things better than Allah SWT knew how to do it. It's as if you understood how to handle things and understand the Quran and other things better than the Prophet SAW did. Does anybody in this room feel that way? Please raise your hand because I want to meet you. So if that's not the case, then we need to take time to reflect. <coughs> we need to take time to look at, again, who our Lord is and then who am I or where am I in relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when it comes down to your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is just that. Your relationship, not everybody else's. How you understand and articulate, let's put it this way. You would like to be sitting in the same class. The teacher will say something about, he'll tell you that uh, this function is A, B, C. And he tells you how to get to A, B, and C through C, D, and E. Now, we both, all of us, heard the same thing. However, not everybody in this room is going to articulate the, the information that was given the same. And that's just a fact of human life. Even the Sahaba didn't agree on different things because they saw things differently. And anybody that wants to say, oh, brother, you can't stuff Allah, you can't say that about the Sahaba. Yes, it is. And those of you who like to read Ibn Kathir, go in there and read and look up the, under the verse talking about the touching of the, of the people who are uh, able to get married, breaking the wudu. He gives you four different opinions from the Sahaba because they differ. That's just a fact of life. That's just how it is. We're not all going to agree. However, the, for, as we say, the furor, the branches may be different, but the asal is the same. The foundation is still the same. So my point is, is that when you're looking at your relationship with Allah, it may not always match up with other people around you. But that is okay because that is you. If you decided to be a person who wanted to walk around with blue hair, which I've seen here, <laughs> or purple which I've also seen with guys. If that's what you want to do, I can't say, you know, stop for the law, brother. You're imitating Kufar. Or stop for the law, brother. You know, that's not how Muslims roll. Look, if that's how you are, if that's the way you wish to express yourself, express yourself. So long as you do not leave, ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammadan wa rasulullah, la best. Be you. Be you. As long as you're making that salat, I could care less if your hair was orange. If you're, so if you say Allahu Akbar, you're fasting during the month of Ramadan. You're trying to improve your character. You just may look a little strange, but <laughs> at the end of the day, you're doing what you have to do. The point is, is that this is about you and Allah. When you are standing before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala on the day of judgment, it's going to be you. Not everybody else. This is about where you are with Allah. Because when you go to hellfire, you're going alone. When you go into paradise, you'll be going alone. It'll be you as an individual going in. And hopefully you'll be meeting the other believers in paradise. I mean, we're all struggling. We all have our demons. We all have our little skeletons, as we say. 
But we also know that our Lord is most merciful. So it's up to us to decide, hey, through our reflection, where am I? Man, I got all kinds of problems going on. I know brothers whose parents are on drugs. Uh, one brother, his wife is a stripper. I, you're funny laughing, it's true. <laughs> I mean, his, his kids don't want to talk to him. Bills are piling up. Has all kinds of problems. Can't get any help from the masjid. I know a sister whose husband is throwing her down the stairs. I know a sister who's, who's, who doesn't have the money to pay her bills, who doesn't have any furniture in her house. The state almost took away her child from her. People have problems. But it's because of their reflection and understanding as to who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that they hold fast to the rope. And every night their hands are going up to Allah saying, Ya Allah, help me. Oh Allah, forgive me. They're reaching out, looking for assistance, not from just other people, because the people can only do but so much. Because it's ultimately, as we said, well, who are the and Qadir? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's in control. And that's who we are turning to. The tests and the trials are great. I don't know your stories. I don't know what you're going through. I hear a few things here and there. MashaAllah. But sometimes for many of you, it's going to get harder before it gets easier. But you have to always remember you are a servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you have to consciously recognize your, your servitude. And then you have to, once you've done that, you have to look at your level of servitude to Allah. How much thanks do you give for the gifts that you've been given? I bet you never thought about something just as simple as thanking Allah for blinking. Never thought about the blink, have you? Keeping your eyes nice and moist and keeping film and dirt and dirt particles from getting into your eye and causing you blindness. You never thought about how important blinking is. You never thought about thanking the law for the little toe. Not understanding how important that little toe is to help keep you balanced. You never thank the law for allowing you to make sajda. Until maybe you're out playing football and you hurt yourself. And now, you, now you're stuck with a leg brace and you got to sit in the chair. It stinks. Because you want to put your head on the ground, but you can't because your leg is in the cast or in the brace. You forget how wonderful it feels to have that head on the ground worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sisters, at certain times of the year or the month, you can't even pray. Now, some sisters will say, Alhamdulillah. <laughs> but those who really are close to Allah SWT will be like, oh, oh man. I want to get that rakat in. I need to ask the Lord for something. When you're close to Allah, these are the kind of things that you feel. But all's well in another day in paradise, isn't it? All's well when we're in that race for popularity. In that race, I mean, I, I know in some of the most of the student associations, I, you call them what, ISOC? Right? I know brothers who are in ISOC and they're sitting, uh, the sister said, well, we need this on the sister's side. And, some of the brothers are mumbling, and one brother, yeah, they need it. <laughs> and he's not saying that because he really believed that. He just wanted the sister to say, oh, my child, love brother. <laughs> <laughs> You're on our side. <laughs> Thank you. That's what 
what you're in it for. You didn't do it because you cared about the sisters. I mean, yeah, you care about the sisters, but you don't care about the sisters. <laughs> right? Sisters, same thing. You know, you could have worn the regular turquoise hijab, but you had to put the one with the sparkle on it. <laughs> Oh, you knew you were wearing a veil to class today, but you did your eyes up. Why? Some people like to be in class. It's funny, but Sheikh Nenewi was mentioning this last week in our class. He said that some people will ask questions they already know the answer to. Just so they can show off about how smart they are. So people can say, ooh, that was a deep question. Mm -hmm. Wow, man, what'd you, man, what'd thinking about it. You came up with that. You already knew the answer, but you wanted to show off. I'm sorry, I want to say show off. <clears throat> For what reasons? Many of you are working and or will be working. And then you'll start taking, you know, you'll start looking at trying to get status there too. Some brothers are already working, sisters are already working, already trying to, you know, Get a promotion so you can go back and tell everybody about how you, know, how you got the promotion. Oh, they just gave me a raise. They gave me a thousand quid more. Talking to the guy who just lost his job. Or someone not doing as well as you. Why? So you can say, some people say, oh, you're doing so well. <laughs> but all is well at another day of paradise, right? We're just living it up. Many of us live like we don't even, like there is no tomorrow. Or shall I say like the hereafter is not even going to be here. We say we believe in Allah, but our actions say something to the contrary. I don't care how young you are or how old you are, we do the same thing. You know they say that a man or certainty goes up and down like a roller coaster. But if you were truly engulfed with nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your level of certainty would be so strong. You couldn't fathom doing anything dishonest or, or, or any act of disobedience. You know, when you love someone, you do almost anything to make them happy. And you feel real bad when you do something to disappoint them. Brothers, and you know as well as I do, you love a sister, you'll do anything. Candies, flower, car, mixtapes, CDs. You even, you'll even go as far as getting a DJ to play some music and let you talk on it. You know I love you as the music is playing in the background. <laughs> You know, I care. And these songs are just to help you understand how I truly feel. <laughs> this is what we'll do. You'll go all out. And then if you do something, you said the wrong thing, or you, you did the wrong thing, then what happens? Oh, I'm so sorry. Please, no. Don't be upset with me. What do you mean it's over? No! I messed up, I messed up, I know! That's what we do, we beg. Male and female. Nobody's exonerated from this. So how is it that if we truly love Allah, that we don't go begging to Him? <coughs> if we truly love Allah, how is it that we don't try to do all the things just to make sure that he's always pleased with every action that we do? Making sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never going to have to see us engaged in any act that would bring about his dislike, displeasure, and or wrath. Because Allah says his punishment will come soon. So I'm asking you, once again, students, 
Some of you might be fathers, mothers. I'm asking you to spend time reflecting. Reflecting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who your Lord is. And where are you in terms of your closeness to Allah? Where are you in terms of your servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How often do you spend yourself in devotional acts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As the member now he says that a basic act, uh, an act that's just merely permissible, can become an act of what worship with the intention. Every time every one of you get up and go to class, you should be saying to yourself, I intend, I intend to go to class to show the, the student body or the world that Muslims are not lazy. I intend to be <coughs> on time to class to show that Muslims are, are, are people who are punctual. I intend to do my homework and do it well to show that we are what intelligent people. I intend to do well in school so that I can get a decent job to help take care of my parents and or a future family and put myself in a position so that I can take care of my family appropriately. For the sake of Allah. Any of these types of intentions takes the simple act of you even getting out of that bed to get ready for class, an act of worship. When you're sitting in the library or in the student center or wherever it is you decide to study, if you say, I am intending to study this so that I can master it for the sake of Allah, then that homework just became an act of worship. So many ways to increase your worship. So many ways to increase closeness to Allah. And it's right there at your fingertips and everything that you do. Hey, even getting up and putting on your clothes, saying, empty that on the way to empty that on that I intend to follow the command of Allah in the Sharia by covering my nakedness. That's worship. You just got to dress. That was worship. That wasn't just putting on clothes, it was worship. When you put that hijab on, I'm putting this on feasibly on the Worship. Hey, we need to smile more. Believe it or not, I walked around a lot, and this is not my first time to the UK. And I walked around many campuses before. Sometimes I just walk around. Nobody knows who I am. I'm not, I'm not a showboat. I mean, a long time ago, I used to wear my, my, my turban and stuff, and I do it occasionally. But I prefer just to kind of blend, because I want to see you. And many of us just walk around looking mean, <laughs> mad at the world. We need to smile. The Prophet Sallallahu said, a smile is sadaqa. A smile is what giving charity. You know, we should be walking around smiling at everybody. <laughs> Just looking. People look like, what's wrong with that guy? <laughs> Smiling. But you know, it'd be nice. People look at you and say, you know what? You Muslims are y'all smiling. We have a reason to smile. Because we're working on becoming closer to Allah. And is that not something to celebrate? One of my teachers once told us, he said, every day is Eid. Every day, that, because why? As the poet used to say, an Eid laysa liman yalbasu jadeed, an Eid liman ta'atuhu yazid. Meaning that the Eid is not for the person who wears new clothes. The Eid is not for Eid al Adha or Eid al Fitr, uh, or, or yeah, Eid al Fitr. That's not for people who just, you know, hey, we just finished fasting, let's, you know, hey, we eat. You know? Adha is, oh, they're on high, so we're just going to celebrate. They just they've completed Arafat. This is the time where worship has been increased. And we're celebrating increased <coughs> worship. That whole time you spent fasting until the month of Ramadan, you increased yourself in worship. And those who really exerted themselves by not just fasting, but also by making extra rakats and tardiwih. I don't care if you make 8 or 20 hours, that argument is done with me. The fact of the matter is if you did two, that's more than you would have done outside of the month of Ramadan. So therefore, you've increased yourself in worship. If you're a person praying, or you're a worker, 
during the month of Ramadan, you've increased yourself in worship. You're gaining. Those who stay up making tahajjud and reading Quran in the middle of the night, making dua, you've increased yourself in worship. So at Eid time, you're celebrating worship. You never thought, many of you may have never thought about it like that. Eid al the same thing. Because if any of you who've ever made hajj and you've been on Mount Arafat, that's exhausting. And all you're doing is standing there. Oh Allah, give me this. Oh Allah, give me that. Oh Allah, forgive me for this. Oh Allah, forgive so and so for that. You know, I remember when I made hajj, I made so much do, I ran out of things to say. <laughs> to the point I could say, oh Allah, I love you. Oh Allah, I love you. That's all I could say because I couldn't think of anything else to say. I made every do that everybody gave me. Every du'a that I could think of giving for people I, you know, I didn't even know. Making du'a for people who hurt me. Making du'a for people I loved and loved me back. Making du'a for everybody I could think of. But the point of the matter is, is that I'm up here making du'a. And that's worship. It's exhausting. So when the Eid comes, we're celebrating worship. One of the things we say when we define hajj, we define hajj as nusuk al-bayt. Benita Nachsusa. To make what? To make uh, a specific intention to do what? Worship at the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because why? Hajj is about worship. I don't know about here, but in my country, one of the things when people come back from Hajj, the first thing people ask is, Did you see any miracles? <laughs> did you see anything? Did you, did you feel something? Did the Allah just like cleanse your heart and just cleanse you? You know, people always have this story. You always got this story. Oh, I saw a fire and someone burnt up and started making a du'a and all of a sudden he was cool as ice. <laughs> saw someone <coughs> levitating across the room in our tent. It's always something. <laughs> the point of the matter is, is that the hide is about worship. So if you're going to hide with the intention of miracles, of getting cleansed, of going there and, and hopefully getting purified, or you're going there to see whatever. You know, you're going there thinking, I'm going to buy some Zam Zam water. Or I saw this cool kufi this brother had last time, so this year I'm getting me one. Or you think about that Izara, or you think about those Dickabees, or you're thinking about these books you're going to buy, then you're not even going for Hodge for the right reason in the first place. Because those people who get to go to Hajj have been invited by al haq They've been invited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to worship. And that is the only intention you should have, is to worship. So therefore, when their Eid comes, you're celebrating an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're out there saying, la bayk Allahumma la bayk, what are you saying? Oh Allah, I am ready. I am ready to receive the, the mercy and the blessings you have for me because of the acts of devotional worship that I'm, I'm, I'm performing. <laughs> and in reality, we should all be saying, La Bek, Allah, Homa, La Bek, every day to receive the gifts and the mercy and the blessings the law has for each and every one of us due to our increased worship to Him on a daily basis. So then every day for us becomes Eid. Every day for us becomes E because we're constantly looking for ways to show and improve and perfect our devotional acts of worship to Allah. All is well on another day of paradise. So, I ask you again to reflect. Reflect. Smile. Be happy. You increase yourself in worship. And for every act of worship that you find yourself increased in, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. Because you know it wouldn't have happened, say that He allowed you to do it. He allowed you to do it. My Sheikh Habib Omar bin Hafif. He used to say, he said to us one time when we were studying, he says, he said, La tadrusu al liyajli ikhtibar. Idrusu al ikhtiyar. And that's my last piece of advice to all of you. You're here in the university. 
and you've got a lot of things ahead of you in front of you. So your time you spend studying should not be just for examinations. Your time, your study here should be because you were chosen. You were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You were chosen to study whatever it is you're studying, to become whatever it is Allah has planned for you to become. But whatever you do, make it for the sake of Allah. Do what you do for the sake of your Lord. And anybody in who's not Muslim, God is God is God. Study for the sake of your Lord. We prefer you become Muslim, but if you don't, that's your choice. But do what you do for the sake of Allah. So that it won't just be another day in paradise. It'll be another day developing yourself, preparing yourself, and building yourself up to enjoy paradise. May Allah allow all of us to be of those people who are in paradise. May Allah bless us to be able to meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the home, at the watering place. That we will all be able to drink from his beautiful and wondrous hand. That we may be able to stand before Allah and hear his beautiful words. Idkhul jannati min rahmah. Enter into paradise from my rahmah. And that all of us, inshallah, will be able to pray in Sufuf al awl in the first line behind the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may we all be able to sit in paradise together, talking about how we met at the university and talked about reflecting on Allah. How we talked about developing our relationship with Allah. Understanding that our relationship with Allah is our own and we are people who are trying to express ourselves in a multitude of ways, but that yet and still we all loved Allah and we were obedient to Allah. <coughs> May Allah allow us to have this gathering in paradise. And as we're listening to each other and talking amongst each other, that we'll hear the birds chirping in paradise. That we'll be drinking the drinks of paradise. And then maybe some of you in this group will be able to say, excuse me, brothers and sisters, I've got to go. I've got a meeting with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of you say, I've got to go because I'm going to meet Musa alayhi salam. I'm going to go sit with Isa alayhi salam for the day. And some of us will be able to say, I'm going to be in nearness to my Lord today. I thank you again for having me, first and foremost. I thank you very much for waiting for me. I thank you for your tolerance. And I would also thank you for whatever dua that you may make for me, inshallah. May Allah continue to guide you and strengthen you all and make easy your way in this life and the hereafter so that for you, it won't just be another day in paradise. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.